today we have the pleasure of being joined by Ija Sandhu. And if you don't know who he is, it's someone you definitely want on your radar for the future. Hi, Idris. Hi, Kemi. Thanks for having me. When I first started identifying as an architect, even though I, I do practice actual architecture, like building things and supervising the construction of them, um, I more so resonated with the verb definition of it instead of the noun definition. Because when you even embody your work within a noun, it's limited by the limitations of the noun definition, right? So you mentioned architect and someone thinks about, oh, somebody that makes buildings. You mentioned technologist, someone thinks about someone that builds technology. But one thing that I love about either identifying as an architect or architectural technologist as a verb is it's an ongoing process. It's an iterative process that never ends. And you're able to cover so much landscape, right? Because architecture deals with physical and digital systems. Technology deals with hardware and software. They're both very parallel journeys. So for me, that term embodies pretty much everything. I think one of the things that always stuck out to me was, you know, that kid that is in the hood, that kid from Compton, that kid that grew up on a laundry just like me, um, wasn't really getting the messaging because that kid thought that I went to a super private school. I had access to you know, private teachers that were teaching me some of these programming languages. When in reality, I was a kid that had to learn JavaScript and I was like learning Fortran. I was learning assembly, which is a very low level programming language used to create operating systems. But even in Compton, I wasn't getting those books, right? So I think in, in 2017 is when I was like, you know, yeah, I'm, I have an opportunity to collaborate with large scale companies and everything, but the true impact is in going back to the communities and empowering the next generation and giving them the right tools to know that they don't have to be like me or they don't have to be the next Steve Jobs or they don't have to be the next, they could be the next them. Ethos DNA um, is a company that stands for ethos, right? So having a design ethos, a set number of principles, DNA standing for design, nature and access, right? So every single thing that we do within ethos, the consultations that we provide with you know, our different clients all has to do with design, nature and access. Um, in fact, I did a TED talk about two and a half years ago where I introduced this new concept that I incorporated into all of my work. It's called aspirational necessitation. I know it's a lot, but breaking it down, it basically just deals with, it's a made up word, by the way, but it, 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 it deals with uh, technology from thinking about how you can apply the 5% of technology that's usually attributed for aspirational products and apply that to the 95% of products that are mostly used by the masses. Because in the world that we live in today, it's the other way around. The aspirational products, the products that most people cannot afford are the products that are designed very well. r and I mean, heavy am amounts of money is invested in those for R&D and things of that, of, of that nature. When in reality, the things that most people use, majority of the economy, majority of society uses that becomes a necessity-based thing for them are designed very, very poorly, okay. right? So it was about, how can I take this information uh, that I've received, you know, working in collaboration with partners like Twitter, Uber, Google, and, and, and Facebook, how can I take that information, that high level of quality that's applied, and how can I democratize that? We think of design uh, as a, not just as a end product, but a process, and more importantly, a way of life. Design is not a thing that you do, it's a way that you live. Now, Spatial Labs, on the other hand, is a company that holds all those same ethoses, but Spatial Labs was specifically created to be the next big thing in, uh, I, I would just say, in communication, right? And the reason why I started Spatial Labs is because we've been doing a, a lot of machine learning, uh, image recognition, slam detection, um, a lot of, you know, for those that aren't familiar, there's, there's like different spectrums that uh, immersive reality experiences sit on, right? You're either on, you know, sort of like this VR, which stands for virtual reality, or you're kind of on this AR, right? And then we have MR, which is a co cohesion of both of these, right? Coercion of both of these. Um, we started Spatial Labs because we felt that if any company could really push the needle of mainstream volumetric uh, technology, spatial reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, it would come from the culture. Right. And the reason why I make such a bold statement is because if we look at hip hop culture, if we look at African culture, you have a huge spread throughout the whole entire world. Right. Um, but in most cases, even the people that are in the music industry are not building the platforms. They're simply yeah. utilizing the platforms. Okay. So if you think about hip hop in itself, hip hop is a startup. It hasn't fully vested yet. It hasn't fully produced products yet. It's produced services, subsets of services, but there's no like hip hop product. There's no hip hop service, right? 
we started to see a change with that with things like um title that jay started you know which is a software as a service and that's the next wave but we're really focusing and thinking about how spatial reality created by those that create entertainment in in itself would cause the biggest revolution in mainstream entertainment whether you're doing front end back end full stack whatever you should take a class on design and whether you're in programming or not you should take a class on design and another to me is sort of like journalism right it's like why journalism because journalism teaches you a lot of things one of those things being empathy right and the ability to put yourself in the perspective of not only the reader but the person or the community you are writing about i don't just come and say hey i have this amazing idea and your brand can benefit from it which i think a lot of collaborators or tech companies get into that box where they create this amazing thing and then they plug people into it right yeah. and we actually do the other way around we have all these loose ideas and then we specifically target a specific person and then we figure out how we can integrate that ecosystem around what they are focused on or what they are thinking of focusing on sometimes if you're just focusing too much on the idea um you'll miss the point right and sometimes too if you're focusing only on the individual you'll also miss the point so okay. it's about the perfect balance and understanding why you create instead of hey i have all these skill sets i can make this i can make this i can make this you have to really laser target and focus but that discernment on how to do that should be based off of sort of that journalism piece which is the empathy of understanding what you're creating for who you're creating and why you're creating it in the last i i would say the last 5 years that this thing has become a, a huge thing right like empathy hid human interface design material design like you know all these different uh, concepts of design there's been an emphasis on empathy only being good right mm -hmm. but the thing with empathy is empathy can actually be used against you as well right um you can have instances where companies can create a product because it's purging on your insecurities right mm -hmm. the empathy of well i'm creating this to give you something but in reality i know i'm getting so much more from it or i know you'll keep coming back to me for this right yeah. so i think when i did that article and i said we need more empathy based design it went back to say there's so many people that you know focus on the numbers or focus on the data when in reality you know i have this book it's called the algorithmic leader and one thing that i i love about it is it has this one principle it's like the data rams of technological advancements the 10 principle and i think like the seventh one says um when in doubt think as a human not an algorithm right and we have so many people inherently because we live in this data aggregated world that will think as an algorithm versus a a human right so if you ask a computer in reality um if we create a sophisticated system and ask it how do we end environmental or a global warming or climate change the most obvious answer is well humans create da 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 so just kill all the humans and then your problem is solved right but that's a very algorithmic way of thinking right it does solve the problem okay. right but it doesn't have the effects that we would want it to right we're not getting to the solution the way that we are so when we start thinking of not just programming empathy or logic because in reality we we're still within the weak ai stage we're not in strong ai yet which is at least 20 15 to 20 years away okay. within the weak ai stage we can still program logic that favors empathy right over everything else it's interesting how covid came in and despite everything that it caused it forced every single company it forced every single startup every single entrepreneur to incorporate empathy as a bylaw within their business model you have to do it now if you don't even incorporate empathy if you don't submit to the will of empathy within your company in itself your company will get left behind right because now the the user is now thinking from an empathetic space when they even use your service how do we balance out creating for the diaspora creating for africa but also realizing that we need to create for everyone right and if something is not fixed it's an opportunity for us to create something even better all while fixing everything else in between right we live in a society now where it's about identifying one group and then being cool with it and then another group and then being cool with it and then being another group when in reality we should be building platforms that are diverse from the ground up and any company or any individual or any entrepreneur that doesn't have a diverse set of individuals principles and ways of life from the ground 
is inherently biased. And as it relates to technology, I think it's really important for us to mention that technology has no bias, right? It's, it can't be biased. It's a tool. You can choose what you want to do with the technology, right? Programs can be biased only because of the bias of the one developing on them, right? But as it exists, code isn't biased. It's the programmer that programs the code that can infer bias, right? So I think like, you know, we hear in this industry a lot of tech bias, tech bias, tech bias. But I don't think it's actually about that. I think it's about those that are building the technologies, right? No one would have thought that the very device, the input device, the multi-touch touchscreen that majority of people use um, would become a breeding ground for a lot of bacteria and things to, to breed on in the era of COVID, right? So especially if we really started thinking about how we could create different interfaces that could respond in a very um, uh, NGL, natural gesture language way. And so we started thinking about how we can leverage and take, take that step a little forward. Take what Steve started, which is understanding that the greatest input device was the human hand and multi-touch and things like that and create interfaces that allow you to communicate with things uh, virtually. So if you look at this uh, this demo right here, this is the interface that you control completely with your hands. And you can see my hand on the camera, but if I just wave my hand over here, it translates onto the screen in real time. And you can see the color as well also translates to my skin. And I can go in and I can interact with different things by simply waving it over. And this is an early build. Um, we can't really show the, the new build, which is way more advanced than this. Um, but let me close all this out. And let's just say um, this was installed in a public location and I needed to navigate somewhere. I would simply just be able to wave my hand over here and come to maps. And in real time, uh, this map would load. And this is connected to actual server in real time as well as uh, using, uh, I think, the Google Maps API. Um, but I'll be able to just come to navigate. And I'll be able to navigate to where I needed to. If I needed to call a car, I could come within this section right here and click Uber. And um, in real time, it would load all these different things for me. And then I can uh, call a car, right? Even with accessibility, we're creating uh, voice, AP we're using, utilizing voice APIs in here as well, as well as um, eye tracking APIs as well, because we understand, you know, not everyone, um, majority of people, right, um, might have you know their hands accessible to them but not everyone you know somebody might have had a hand amputated well in that case and then they can use eye tracking right um well what if they're blind um in that case and they can use voice right so we're thinking about how to solve some of these largest issues that are going to not only have been arising from covid but it's going to be the future of how we communicate with devices and thinking about how we can be prepared for that as well as mit uh, mitigate as much bias as possible from this next evolution of where technology is going, which we feel strongly is volumetrics and spatial reality. One thing that I'm extremely grateful for is the ability for my unconventionality to not only be respected, um, but to be welcomed, right? Um, I always did things unconventionally, whether it was my time at Google or uh, my time at Uber or my time at Facebook, even as it exists even now. Um, for me, it's always been about difference, right? Because I never just wanted to be another programmer. I just, I never wanted, you know, to people to mention me as another designer or as another architect. I always wanted to be the unconventional person that had intrinsic value. Because sometimes when you're in a space, you can put your value heavily influenced by what the market tells you or heavily influenced by what you're told your value is. And for me, I always said, I set my value and I'm going to do this very, very differently. And that's one word of advice that I would like to give to anybody that is in any space, do not wait for someone to tell you your value. Set your own value. You have your own intrinsic value. Your relationships, your value is far more comparable as well as valued more than your skill level. Skills can be attained. You know, we're in, in 2020, we're using all these different programming languages that I'm not going to mention because I don't want to like this AI. But, uh, we're using all these different design things or blah, blah, whatever that aren't going to be relevant in the next 10 years. It's inherent. You know, we all have the newest this device or that device. But two years from now, there's going to Moore's law don't even make sense anymore because it's not about transistors on a on, on a silicon wafer anymore. Right. So I think what's going to really carry the innovation forward is 
understanding that intrinsic value that you bring to the table and how you can encompass that in everything you do rather than only relying on your skill sets. I inherently know that these, this larger conversation we're having around how to truly uh, democratize technology um, is a great test. But the beauty of that test in itself is if you knew you would start something but not finish it, would you still do it, right? And I think that's what motivates me every single day, that I'm fighting for things that and, 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 and larger concepts um, that I probably will, will definitely see the fruits of it on the long term. But for that true level of full scalability, um, I'll, I'll still be a part of it, but the next generation are the ones that are actually going to build and lead on that. And that excites me so much.